Did you know that the Angular team has announced that RxJS is becoming optional in Angular? If you are not aware of this, if you want to know all about what this means for the future of Angular, this is the right video for you. I'm going to summarize everything that we know until today about the future of Angular with optional RxJS. I'm going to talk about the reasons why the Angular team decided to go down this path. I'm going to talk about the benefits of making RxJS optional and I'm going to throw in also a bit of my personal experience and opinion writing applications with minimal RxJS in the last year or so. Welcome back to the Angular University channel. I'm Vasco. Let's dive right in. So when did the Angular team start mentioning about the possibility of making RxJS optional? And are there some clear answers about when to use signals versus RxJS? The first reference that I can find to this is on the official Angular RFC of signals, so the request for comments official document, where the Angular team has provided here some hints about what was to come. So let's pay close attention to this. And the link to this RFC is in the comments together with all the other sources that I'm going to quote during this video. So question, should I use signals and or RxJS? What is the difference and role of those primitives? And the answer here is going to give you some critical insight into the thinking of the Angular team about when RxJS is or is not a good fit for building your applications. So answer, signals, would be the reactive primitive deeply integrated in the framework and so a go-to solution for state synchronization needs. This is the first reactive tool that people should be reaching out for. So what does this mean? This means that if you are writing your applications in reactive style, you should first reach out to signals and try to see if signals alone solve most, if not all, of your problems. At least that's my personal interpretation of what is written here. So we should reach out for signals first when trying to write applications in reactive style. Only if in certain particular cases signals are not enough, then we can consider something more, namely and typically in the Angular ecosystem, RxJS. So what about RxJS? Let's hear what the Angular team has to say about it. RxJS shines when it comes to, and here is the critical part, orchestrating complex asynchronous operations. So the Angular team seems to think that RxJS is a great fit for certain particular use cases that require the orchestration of asynchronous events in complex ways. Now, many of you might already be thinking that many applications don't have this need. And that's true, but much more on that in a moment. Right now, let's continue. What does the Angular team think about RxJS? We definitely see use cases where RxJS shines and solves problems in a very elegant way. This is why we are investing in a good interoperability story between signals and RxJS observables. So again, RxJS is a great fit for certain particular use cases. I guess that what is implied here is that it's not a great fit for everything. Let's see what they say in the next sentence. And this one is really critical. This one is the first place where I saw the Angular team publicly say that maybe RxJS is not a solution for everything. Let's read. Having said this, we would like to see a world where RxJS is adopted by teams as a choice for specific use cases rather than a mandated or default best practice. I mean, this sentence here is huge. What this is saying us and my personal interpretation of it is that the Angular team seems to believe that RxJS is a great fit for specific use cases. But just because it's a great fit for those very specific use cases, that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to use it everywhere for everything. That there are different ways of doing things. That you could reserve the use of RxJS just for the specific cases where it's a good fit and solve your other simpler problems in your application in a more readable, simple and approachable way without necessarily using 
RxJS in every single place of your application. That's my personal interpretation. Let's then read the next one. Also a very important sentence. There are many applications that can be written without complex event orchestration. And we would like to encourage people to experiment with different patterns. So this is also critical. What does this mean? It ties back to what I mentioned here on this, on this initial sentence, that there are a lot of applications, and I would reason personally that the vast majority of applications don't have complex asynchronous orchestration scenarios, and therefore they don't usually need RxJS, except maybe in very particular use cases, if at all. And that the Angular team is actively here saying that maybe you don't need RxJS for your application. That's my personal reading of it. And they are actively encouraging us, the Angular community, to quote, and this is critical, experiment with different patterns. So we are actively being encouraged by the Angular team to try to build our applications in different ways that don't involve using RxJS everywhere. All right, so now this part here of the RFC talks about the active advice of what we should uh, try to do, try to experiment with different patterns, but uh, it doesn't say a lot about why the Angular team decided to go in this direction. There's more information here, of course, you should see the rest of the RFC, but about the topic of why choose the direction of signals and why make RxJS optional, for that, I'm going to quote another source, which is the JS Party episode 310 podcast on Angular signals with uh, Pavel Kozlovsky and Alex Rickabau from the Angular team. So you are going to be able to find the episode here linked in the description of this video. Go and hear it uh, yourself as well. And here I'm just going to quote certain parts of the transcript that I'm going to link in the description of this video. So again, the interview is very interesting. Here I'm just going to give you the highlights. So here the Angular team talks about why the approach of signals and they talk about the historically uh, Angular change detection was based on the notion of dirty checking that was inherited from Angular JS where you would scan all the expressions on the page before and after to know which components need to be updated. But they also mentioned that even though that was the original way that the Angular framework was designed to be used, in practice, what a large part of the community was doing was using the framework very differently. So they would plug state or events coming from RxJS into the framework. And that was quite surprising to the Angular team because the whole idea of the framework was that it was built on the assumption that the developer doesn't have to worry about telling the framework when the view should be updated, when new data is available. Instead, Angular with its default change detection mechanism would take care of everything. We could use just regular data objects and the framework would figure it out. But in practice, People were using RxJS to feed the template with the async pipe. And so the way that the framework was being used and the way that it was designed mostly in its original form to be used was quite different. So here is the critical part. There was this very strong disconnection between how the framework was designed or thought of at the beginning and how the framework was actually being used. So it was due to this this connection between these two things that the Angular team thought that it would be a good time to rethink the way that we do uh, reactive programming in Angular and how we can build applications in reactive style with Angular that is a good common middle ground between the way that the framework was originally designed, which was just use regular data objects, the framework will figure it out, and the way that a lot of the applications are being built, which is fully based on RxJS. Now let's talk about the RxJS support in Angular and why the Angular team decided to make it optional. We have here some hints at the level of the interview. 
So, for example, Angular, they say here the Angular team, is famously of two minds about RxJS. Because, and you know this if you have been uh, writing applications for a while, some parts of the framework are very well integrated with RxJS. For example, the HTTP client returns observables, the router, etc. While other parts of the framework, such as core change detection mechanism or things such as component inputs, don't use observables. And that has kind of always frustrated some people. And in particular, the Angular team mentions here that in developer surveys, they would often get 50% of Angular developers say, please, I need more RxJS. Can you support these extra things? And 50% of the respondents say, please, no more RxJS. I don't want to have to deal with this thing. So the Angular team has noticed that not only there was a disconnect between the way that the framework was originally designed and the way that the framework was actually being used on the field, but they also noticed that the partial support that the framework has for RxJS was problematic. People didn't know if they should go all in with RxJS or avoid it altogether. The framework supported in some parts and not others. That was causing some small amount of friction in the community. So community friction around RxJS, that's another important factor for what was decided to happen with the future of Angular. Let's cover another critical factor that is talked about here, which has to do with the feeling that RxJS has, according to the Angular team, continuously frustrated new developers who are coming for the framework for the first time, to feel like they almost have to be an RxJS expert before they can even start to write Angular code in the way that they're being told that it should be written. All right, so this is another critical factor for the decision that was taken. The Angular team realized that the use of RxJS systematically and the recommendation to use it in every Angular application was actually acting as a barrier to entry to the adoption of Angular. By tying RxJS to the framework, the steep learning curve of RxJS was inherently slowing down the adoption of Angular and driving away developers from the framework that would otherwise feel comfortable using it, using other patterns and best practices other than RxJS. This interview also shed some further light about this question here about when to use RxJS or not. So they say here at a given moment that there are probably many applications that will just fire a fetch request, get the data and work with the data. There is nothing to orchestrate there is nothing to cancel. So this further reinforces the notion that not every single application and use case necessarily has complex asynchronous event orchestration scenarios, and therefore not every application will need RxJS, that it should probably only be used in the places where it's really needed because it's a powerful tool, but it's a machinery that is more expensive to operate. So it comes at the cost in terms of the learning curve and in terms of the complexity of the code as well. All right, so let's quickly summarize everything that we have seen here. And the reminder part of the video is going to be about the decisions that were taken and what we're going to see going forward. So to summarize, according to what we can read here between the RFC, the interview, etc. RxJS is really not the best fit for all use cases. It's a good fit for certain complex orchestration scenarios when you are going to have a stream of events that you want to orchestrate in a very specific way. But in general, it's not the best tool for the vast majority of applications to be used by default. On the other hand, it has a very steep learning curve that was causing friction in terms of adoption of the framework. On the other hand, some people wanted even more RxJS, but other people, and it was about half-half, wouldn't want RxJS at all. They wouldn't not want to deal with it. So the Angular team, due to all these factors, has decided to create 
a different solution for doing reactive programming in Angular, which is signal-based, and in parallel with that, to make RxJS optional. Now, what does that mean in terms of the future of Angular and RxJS? Making RxJS optional does not mean at all that RxJS will no longer be correctly supported in the framework. In fact, according to the Angular team, in the NGConf 2024 conference, when they have given more visibility to the optional status of RxJS in the future of Angular, they have explicitly said that the support for RxJS in Angular going forward will be better than ever. RxJS is going to be better integrated in the framework than ever. So to those 50% of the community that want to really dive deep into the RxJS approach and its way of doing things, they will be able to do that better than ever. But all the other developers, the other 50% that would prefer to build applications without RxJS, they are going to be able to do that. So RxJS will eventually not even be necessary in your application bundle if you choose not to use it. In this conference talk, the Angular team has confirmed the existence of a long-term project which will make the dependency on RxJS optional. So gradually, the different modules of the framework are going to have their APIs revisited to make RxJS optional, and the whole process is going to be via RFC. So we're going to do the revision of the API of HTTP, forms, the router, etc., so that they are better integrated with the signal story and also at the same time to make RxJS optional in those parts of the application where so far we did not have any other alternatives. Notice that in certain parts of the application, RxJS is already optional, which is uh, something that does not get talked a lot about. So for example, in uh, guards, in resolvers, in the router, you can opt for returning either an observable or a promise, or even in certain places, a primitive value. Of course, that would not be helpful for a synchronous scenario, so the choice is really between a promise and an observable. Also, the async pipe, you can pass it a promise also, not only an observable. So RxJS is already kind of optional in certain places of the framework, and I suspect that that approach is going to be extended to the whole surface of the framework. So this is what you can expect in Angular going forward. And if you want to start experimenting today with making RxJS optional and less used in your own applications, you can check out here this course that I'm creating that is currently in pre-release mode, which is called Modern Angular with Signals course. It's this one here, Modern Angular with Signals. Here I explain how to build applications in Angular today with signals and a minimal amount of RxJS using new default best practices and patterns, mostly around the use of promises and async await for your service layer. So that's all I've got for today. Let me know in the comment section below what do you think about making RxJS optional in Angular. Thank you so much for watching everyone and I will see you next time. Cheers everyone!